Good afternoon. I'm Patricia Lee of the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Public Education. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our program on civil disagreements, originalism, and the Constitution. This is the second in a planned series of moderated debates on current, critical, and often contentious civic questions sponsored by the American Bar Association Division for Public Education, the Chicago Chapter of the American Constitution Society, the Chicago Chapter of the Federalist Society, and Reform for Illinois. The program will begin with a question, followed by a parliamentary style debate, then conclude with a moderated discussion among debaters and Q&A from the audience. Today's debate and discussion will address the idea that all statements in the US Constitution should be interpreted based on the original understanding at the time the Constitution was adopted, hence the concept of originalism. Debate materials are linked in the chat. Please share any questions you may have in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and note that Illinois lawyers may receive CLE credit for this program. Simply watch for a follow-up email tomorrow with instructions. Without further ado, another thank you to today's program organizers, the Chicago chapters of the American Constitution Society and the Federalist Society and Reform for Illinois. And now I'm a, I am pleased to introduce Elisa Kaplan, Executive Director of Reform for Illinois, who will introduce our speakers and moderate today's debate and discussion. Elisa. Thank you so much, Pat. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you everyone for taking time out of your Friday afternoons to come join us and talk about this incredibly important topic. Uh, my name is Elisa Kaplan and I'm the Executive Director of Reform for Illinois. Reform for Illinois was founded in 1997 by a Democrat, Senator Paul Simon, and a Republican, Lieutenant Governor Bob Kustra. We're a nonpartisan organization that advocates for policies that create a more ethical, accountable and inclusive democracy. This year has seen some of the most controversial Supreme Court decisions of my lifetime. The court overruled Roe v. Wade, struck down longstanding state gun control measures and drastically changed the court's approach to school prayer and religious funding of schools. Central to debates about these decisions and to their controversial nature is the role of constitutional interpretation especially the role of what's commonly known as originalism. So we are so fortunate today to have two renowned constitutional experts to guide us through a discussion about this timely issue. The resolution we're debating, as Pat mentioned, is that the United States Constitution should be interpreted according to its original meaning. Arguing for the, for the resolution is John McGinnis. Professor McGinnis is the George C. Dix Professor of Professor of Constitutional Law at Northwestern School of Law. He is the co-author of Originalism and the Good Constitution and author of Accelerating Democracy, Transforming Government Through Technology. Importantly, he was also my constitutional law teacher some years ago in what was by far the best class I ever took at Northwestern. We had our share of civil disagreements back then, so I knew he was exactly the right person for this event. It's a pleasure to finally have you on the hot seat for once, Professor. Arguing against the resolution is David Strauss. Professor Strauss is the Gerald Ratner Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School and the Faculty Director of the Supreme Court and Appellate Clinic. He is the author of The Living Constitution and the co-author of Equality and Democracy, The Enduring Constitutional Legacy of the Warren Court. He is also a co-editor of the Supreme Court Review. The format will be a formal debate followed by a discussion. Each participant has 15 minutes to make their argument and then three minutes for rebuttal. After that, we'll extend the discussion with additional questions. There will be a timer on the screen and because it's visible to the participants, I will not provide warnings. We'll take questions from the audience via the Q&A feature you can see at the screen. It's now my honor to turn the floor over to Professor McGinnis and Professor Strauss. Professor McGinnis, since you are arguing in favor of the resolution, you go first. So thanks very much. And thanks very much for your introduction, Elisa, and thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to discussing this with uh, uh, David Strauss, whose work I've long admired. Uh, so let's uh, begin with a simple definition of originalism. Originalism asserts the meaning of a constitutional provision is how it was understood at the time it was enacted. What James Madison long ago called the sense in which the Constitution was ratified. 
But describing originalism does not fully answer the question of why we should follow originalism, at least in cases of first impression today. Why the original meaning is, as Madison also said, uh, and I quote, the sense in which it is a, the, the, the Constitution alone is legitimate. We can make a fairly simple, straightforward three-step argument, I think, for that proposition. Uh, that our original meaning of the Constitution is likely a good charter of governance, or at least the best charter we can make uh, for a Constitution through, uh, if it is interpreted according to its original meaning. First, relatively stringent supermajority rules for its passage are the best way to make a Constitution. Second, the United States was made mainly under such rules. And third, it was the original meaning that obtained that consensus. Thus, it should be followed. Note the structure of this defense of originalism. It defends the quality of constitutional provisions largely by reference to the likely consequences that flow from the process that created them. Thus, to the virtue of the constraint on judges, which is often an argument for originalism that comes from following rules, it adds the even more important virtue that the rules are likely beneficial. Let me expand on each of these three points. First, relatively supermajoritarian lawmaking is the way to make a good constitution. It won't make a perfect constitution, nothing will. Uh, but it is a good one and there's no other superior method. Thus, as with a criminal trial conducted under fair rules of civil procedure, we should take its results as final. We can see the virtues of supermajoritarian rules for constitution making by contrasting it with majority rule. Well, something close to majority rule is generally thought to be the best approach to ordinary legislation. And thus, if we follow the original meaning of ordinary legislation in statutory interpretation, permitting a majority to entrench constitutional norms will be problematic. First, because entrench norms can't be easily eliminated, controversial entrenchments can be extremely divisive and partisan. Yet a majority tends to enact divisive and partisan norms. Supermajority rules, however, address that problem by permitting only norms with a substantial consensus and bipartisan support to be enacted. A broad consensus for a constitution creates legitimacy, allegiance, and even affection as citizens come to regard it as their common bond. The long-term nature of constitutional entrenchments also makes it less likely that majorities will enact desirable ones. Individuals have a heuristic problem in thinking about the future. They think it's gonna to be too much like the past. Hence why stock market bubbles go up and up and housing bubbles go up and up until they don't. Supermajority rules compensate for that deficiency too by restricting the agenda of proposals because fewer proposals have a realistic chance of Propose uh, 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 passing that restricted agenda encourages a richer stream of information, improving deliberations among the, uh, about the Constitution. Even more significantly, a strict supermajority rule for passage and repeal of constitutional provisions improves the quality of entrenchments by creating what's known in political science as a veil of ignorance. Because proposals so entrenched under supermajority rules can't be easily repealed in the future, also under supermajority rules, citizens and legislatures can't be certain how the provisions will affect them and their children. Hence, they're more likely to consult the interest of all future citizens, the public interest, rather than their narrow parochial interest. That kind of consensus forcing process is not only good in the abstract, it creates very substantial real world benefits. Take religious freedom and the freedom of speech. They are more likely to be supported when individuals can't be sure that they and their children will be part of a religious or uh, minority or majority in the future. This they will parcel out power, power to the president and other branches, not on the basis of who will control them next year, but on the relative institutional capacities for the future. Now, the second proposition is that our constitution and its amendments have been passed in the main under appropriate supermajority rules, and thus the norms entrenched in the constitution tend to be desirable. The amendment process is obviously stringently supermajoritarian, and so effectively was the process by which the constitution of 1789 was enacted, a consensus obtained at the convention in Philadelphia, 
And then ratification by Article 7 is required supermajority super majority of states. Well, there's one significant way in which those supermajority rules were not appropriate, the exclusion of African-Americans and women. These supermajoritarian rules have been followed by supermajoritarian correction in the form of the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 19th Amendment that moved towards giving African-Americans and women the rights of white male citizens. It's those supermajoritarian origins, I think, that help account for the beneficence of the Constitution. For instance, to obtain ratification in the necessary nine states, which was not at all a sure thing, the nationalists had to promise that immediately a Bill of Rights would be enacted once the new government was established. The third step to my argument follows from the first two. The original meaning should be followed because it was the original meaning that was crucial to obtaining the supermajoritarian consensus that makes the constitutional provisions presumptively desirable. It wasn't my understanding, it wasn't the understanding of any contemporary jurist that made them think these provisions were good. It was their understanding on which they voted to make them our fundamental law. Now those passing constitutional provisions, of course, recognized that there were ambiguities sometimes in these provisions. But they also knew that a legal machinery existed around the enactments to clarify ambiguities. The Constitution was not created ex nihilo, but against a background of law. The Constitution, of course, declares itself to be law. It also refers to interpretive conventions in the text, suggesting uh, that it uh, thought that uh, the Constitution would be interpreted according to law. As a result, uh, today, originalist scholars deploy the legal background, the legal background, the legal meaning of the words, the legal interpretive rules surrounding the Constitution to show how clauses that might seem vague or ambiguous to us, an example would be uh, the cruel and unusual punishment clause, actually had a clear meaning. In that case, forbidding only those punishments that had fallen into long dissuaditude. Those interpretive rules also included a rule mentioned in the early Republic that interpreters should follow the interpretation supported by the stronger evidence in cases of ambiguity or disagreement. Thus, originalism recognizes that there may sometimes be evidence on both sides of an interpretive question, but suggests we should choose the uh, better supported one. In any event, a comparison of the continental consensus that is at heart of the constitutional making process shows what's wrong with theories of judicial interpretation that allow judges to update the constitution departing from its original meaning. First, only a very small number of justices generate norms through their decision. But in my view, constitutional lawmaking demands the participation of the many. Second, the Supreme Court is drawn from a very narrow class of society. That narrowness begins with the fact they're all elite lawyers who live in that most artificial city of the world, Washington, D.C. But today, that narrowness is even more extreme, except for our most recent justice, Amy Coney Barrett. They've all attend, graduated from one or two schools, Harvard or Yale. Now, as for geographic diversity, until Justice Scalia and Ginsburg I died, I have to grant that they did at least hail from four of the five boroughs of New York City. Finally, constitutional lawmaking is supermajoritarian, while the Supreme Court rules by majority vote of the nine members. And note, too, that the constitutional adjudication does not call on judges just to make relatively technical decisions on contract or tort law, but instead decisions on highly fraught moral issues like abortion, which if they are not determined by reference to the original meaning, depend on the resolution of competing ideologies of human flourishing by a very small and insulated group of people. In short, these several reasons suggest that the doctrines fabricated by the Supreme Court justice by means other than originalism are likely to lead to worse consequences than doctrines that follow from the original meaning of the Constitution. The most fundamental objection, I think, to this defense of originalism is indeed that the consensus nature of the constitutional provisions made them desirable when they were enacted. But they're now very old. 
and they no longer produce the benefits they once did in a changed world. But a good constitution, a constitution that screened through the delicate and careful supermajoritarian process has broad avenues to deal with technological and cultural change. First, the states themselves have few restrictions on their powers, absent congressional action. Their experiments to address social change can be readily adopted by other states in a continental republic with a free press. Again, let me make this concrete. Federalism in the modern era has been a great catalyst for freedoms. For instance, take sexual autonomy. Individuals went to tolerant jurisdictions and there showed through both writing and action that society could tolerate more diverse social norms without falling into disorder. That has ultimately been a far more important to liberty than new cases from the Supreme Court. After all, the Supreme Court can only change the law, not the social norms that have been so important to under, under a girding of new kinds of uh, sexual freedom. Congress has substantial, second, Congress has substantial but not unlimited power to legislate. And the powers are often stated as principles like the Commerce Clause that expand in scope even if they don't change in meaning as the nation matures. Finally, the Constitution creates an amendment process by which to replace provisions that have become outmoded. It has sometimes been thought the amendment process is just too difficult, but the historical record belies this. During the period when originalism was the dominant mode of interpretation, usually important amendments were passed. The 16th Amendment permitting the income tax, the 17th Amendment permitting the direct election of senators, the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote, and note that many of these amendments were passed by people who might have been thought to have vested interest against the amendment. State legislatures ceded powers by giving up power to the people to choose senators. Men diluted their own votes by giving votes to women. But as non-originalism became more powerful, the amendment process fell into disuse, disuse for enactment of profound social change. That's not surprising. If originalism, if it's originalism that protects the amendment process, if judges can change the constitution, most people will put their energy into trying to get the right judge appointed and creating a culture where it's thought proper for judges not to be constrained by the original meaning. Of course, that's not just some hypothetical culture. That was our culture for many, many decades. Thus, originalism and the amendment process are mutually supportive. There can't be any normatively attractive originalism without the amendment process. But just as originalism won't work without the amendment process, there can be no effective amendment process without originalism. In my view, the amendment process and originalism march under a single banner. And what does that banner proclaim? It says, we, the people, rule here not we the elite judges. In short, a good constitution, like the other great achievements of civilization, can't be the work of we the people of any one generation. I think this perspective responds to the claim that the constitution represents the dead hand of the past burdening the future. To the contrary, a good constitution helps steady the present by creating a framework of governance, which then becomes part of an intergenerational enterprise. Each generation can participate in adding to our fundamental document under similar supermajoritarian rules as the past. Each generation can be assured that its work will be respected by the next, just as it respects the work of its predecessor. Edmund Burke famously said that a good society was a compact between the living, the dead, and the yet unborn. I think our constitution translates Burke's great insight into an effective legal mechanism for enduring social governance. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Professor. I can't believe how you wrapped that up right on the button. <laughs> um, Professor Strauss, now your 15 minutes. Well, thank you very much, Alyssa. Thank you all for the thanks to the organizers for putting this together. Uh, thanks to all of you for 
uh, being here virtually. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to see my, uh, my friend, John McGinnis. Let, let me sort of start by saying that uh, I've, I've got some unkind things to say about originalism. Um, but I want to make it clear that what I'm criticizing is a certain practice that sails under the name of originalism in American constitutional law. I think there are a lot of historians who are doing great work in figuring out what the people who were present at the founding of our nation, how they thought about things, what did their world look like to them. Um, and I also think there are, there are sort of very principled scholars, people of uh, uh, not only great skill, uh, but complete intellectual integrity, great straight shooters, and I don't mean to criticize them at all. And I, I put uh, my friend John McGinnis at the top of that list. Uh, having said that, I think originalism these days, in most of its manifestations in actual decisions, excuse me, and in kind of the surrounding advocacy in the public sphere and newspapers and and uh, uh, podcasts and and uh, social media, originalism is a rhetorical cover for positions that people are taking for other reasons. I don't really want to suggest that in most instances, people are acting in bad faith. I don't think they are. But remember what I said about historians going and looking at, trying to reconstruct what people in the past thought about their lives. You know, this historian slogan, the past is a foreign country. It's very difficult to figure out how things looked to them back then. And given that, when you say you're going to figure out, you know, what was the original meaning or the original understanding, what originalists have kind of shifted around from time to time and what they're looking at, but whatever the specific formulation, there's a natural human tendency to see what you want to see. And, uh, you know, framers, smart guys. Um, I admired them a lot. Can I think of any other smart people? Well, well, there's me. I'm smart too. So probably we agree, James Madison, you and I, right? Now, of course, people don't articulate that, but I really think something like that is going on in a lot of these cases. Now, how can that be when originalism at least presents itself as a form of rigorous uh, analytical and scholarly discipline? And as I say, to not to, I, I don't want to disparage the people for whom it really is that, but a lot of the public debate and a lot of the people in positions of power, it's not that for them. So what is, what is the issue? I guess a quick way to put it is that originalism as an approach to 21st century American constitutional law is not coherent and plausible. You can make it coherent, but then it won't be plausible. It'll lead to conclusions that none of us would accept. You can make it plausible, but then you build in so many qualifications and abstractions and escape hatches into what originalism means that it no longer holds together as a workable theory and that it tends to justify the outcomes that are really being driven by something else. Why is that? Uh, you can isolate a couple of reasons. Let me give you three or four. One is when you think about the idea of recovering the original meaning of a provision, that's hard when the provision was adopted a long time ago. Even if you think about things you know, relatively close to us in our own lifetimes, the Equal Rights Amendment, well, does the Equal Rights Amendment mean, if, if it had been adopted, that there can't be single-sex public education? I don't know. Some people thought that's what it meant. Some people thought, no, 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 it'd be okay under certain circumstances. Um, uh, it's, does it mean women cannot, can, women can be barred from combat roles in the military? The military doesn't want to do that anymore, but that was a relatively recent development. Lively debate about that. Um, so that's, those are things that we lived through. And if someone were to sort of a time traveler from the next century were to come to us and say, you know, what did they mean when they said equal rights under law for women? What did they mean about single sex public education? What, what did you guys mean? We would probably say, I, you know, I mean, we didn't really settle that. I mean, some people thought it meant one thing, some people thought it meant another. We eventually got enough votes together to enact the ERA and sorry, you know, time traveler, it's your problem. Um, and that is even excluding the things John mentioned about rapid technological change or other developments of, of that kind, where, you know, go ahead if you want, go back and ask 
uh, uh, sort of uh, imaginatively ask the framers what they thought about the internet or about heavier than air, heavier than air uh, uh, travel um, uh, or about miracle drugs or about any of these things. You know, how does the Commerce Clause apply to instantaneous transcontinental communications? You know, how, how does it apply? What does it mean for that? I think their answer probably would have been, you know what, we have a country to start. We don't have time for science fiction, okay? Um, and that's uh, not common, but those are just the kind of issues that get litigated. When the meaning is clear and no one can seriously dispute it, the president has to be 35, two senators to a state, fine, no one fights about that. But when you get into these other questions, that's when figuring out the original meaning becomes many times, not always, but many times, very difficult. So there's there's problem number uh, number one. I, mean, I sort of like to think of people who write their history PhD dissertations on uh, aspects of the framing, and they pick some aspect, and they'll develop exactly how people thought about it then. But if they look into that and they find out, you know, actually they were just kind of confused about whether that behavior by law enforcement officers constituted a search, they they were they said a whole bunch of stuff. It didn't make a lot of sense. That history PhD student can just say, I'm going to write my thesis on a different subject. If you're a judge deciding the case, you can't do that. And if you pretend to be an originalist or purport to be an originalist, you've got to figure out the unfigure outable. Okay, that's problem number one. Problem number two, supposing we figure it out. Supposing uh, that we're satisfied, when I'm leaving the merits aside, we're satisfied the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to bear arms. What do we do with the argument, well, okay, that's fine. It protects individuals' right to bear arms. In a agrarian society, highly unurbanized, in which firearms were manufactured by blacksmiths, didn't work most of the time, could not be shipped through interstate commerce networks very quickly. I mean, sure, in that world, maybe they thought there was an individual right to bear arms. What does that say about our world? And in many ways, I think that is, I don't know if it's the most, most the way in which the temptation to read what you want into the past is most present. But I think that is a very underrated problem. The problem they call it the problem of translation or the problem of updating. Okay, we got to somehow, you know, semi-miraculously, we got the original meaning as of the time of the framing. What about today? What do we do with that today? Do we just say, well, we're going to pretend nothing changed? And our society is identical to theirs. So it means the same thing today. That doesn't seem right. Do we update it and say, well, yeah, sure, that made sense for them, but not for now? Well, then what happened to originalism? Okay, second, that's the second problem. Third problem. Um, this is the problem of the dead hand that John mentioned. It's Thomas Jefferson's famous line that the, the world belongs to the living. Why are we en enchaining ourselves to people who are long since dead? Noah Webster, one of the founding generation people, he's a dictionary guy. Um, I'm going to paraphrase him, sort of update him a little bit. Said, uh, this is an updated version of Noah Webster. Uh, you know, we have, uh, um, we today uh, have more in common with the citizens of, let's say, New Zealand, pick some well run, successful liberal state. We have more in common with them. We have more in common with them economically, technologically, morally, than we do with the people who lived in the late 19th century, late 18th century, the mid 19th century, much more in common with them. If someone came along and said, you know, I've got the answer to all your tough problems, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, abortion, criminal defendants' rights, affirmative action, I got the answer for you. Look at what New Zealand is doing. We'd say, well, why? I mean, they might be right. I mean, they, they seem to be doing okay, but why do we follow them? Originalism makes a much less plausible demand on us to follow the decisions of people who lived in dramatically different societies. So given those problems, I think it's not surprising that originalism tends to serve as, in many instances, as cover for what people want to do for some other reason. Well, what are the some other reasons? Let me sort of, and, and let me sort of answer that by also acknowledging the um, the criticism of the sort of defense of originalism, which goes, look, look, buddy, the famous Chicago 
saying you can't beat somebody with nobody, what's what's your alternative? You got an alternative to the following original meaning? Oh, living constitution. I wrote a book with that title. Living constitution. That just means that judges do what they want. I mean, it's a criticism that needs to be taken into account. I think the answer lies on the face of pretty much any Supreme Court opinion and absolutely any lower court opinion in a constitutional case that you pick up. What do they talk about? Now and then the Supreme Court will talk about all the original stuff. Most of the time, the Supreme Court and virtually all the time, the lower courts, what do they talk about? They talk about precedents. And that's our system. Ours is a system built on precedent. If you want to say, yeah, but it started with the Constitution, that's fine. You could see the Constitution is kind of a font. And we've kind of taken that and said, OK, the freedom of uh, Congress coming to the law of Virginia, freedom of speech, we've got to figure out what that means. Let's kind of work it out. Um, and it's all derived from that. Um, that's fine. But the actual operative work is done by precedent, not by original meanings. The graded virtue of that is you don't get yourself in a situation where you're requiring society to do things that are anathema to people. That's the plausibility problem with originalism. These are notorious problems. Brown against Board of Education is inconsistent with the original understandings. There are some efforts at revisionist history on that. That's a separate conversation. But even if you buy the revisionism on that, the case that the 14th Bill was never intended to give people a right to marry people of a different race is extremely hard to refute. The, uh, the, an excellent case can be made that the First Amendment has no application to criminal punishments. It's not an ironclad case, but it's a decent case that the First Amendment is about prior restraints, not about criminal punishments. After all, those guys enacted the Alien and Sedition Acts, which provided for criminal punishments of dissenters. Now, maybe that's right. Maybe that's maybe I'm mischaracterizing the original meaning, but you're not going to get that answer by staring at the words freedom of speech. If you look to the historians, they're going to disagree. Is there any live controversy about that today? No, of course not. And why, of course not? This actually goes back to something else John said, which I really want to agree with wholeheartedly, which is that our constitution today is the work of multiple generations. That we started out of one place and we struggle with these issues over time and we've come to some answers and then be more or less satisfactory. A lot of them, are just many of us are not satisfactory. They need to be rethought, recast, reevaluated maybe moved away from. Um, but that's the way we understand the Constitution, not by trying to do the work of archaeologists and uncover some uh, gems of insight left behind by people who lived in a wholly different world several generations ago. John mentioned Edmund Burke, and I, I, you know, I am totally on board with that. Burke was the patron saint of the common law. Uh, if you read uh, Burke's work, he is trying to apply to society at large, the way common law thinkers, people committed to precedent, um, think about the development from the past. You can move, not too suddenly, but don't lock yourself into the past. After all, Burke was a Whig. He, he was a member of the party that supported the regicide. He was not someone who said we have to worship our ancestors at all costs. And that I think is what our constitution is. That's why it's a living constitution. And if I could just pick up on one other thing John said, I don't mean this is a kind of gotcha, it's the opposite actually, I think it sort of shows how, how, how broad-minded John is and how sort of uh, uh, how much intellectual integrity he has. Um, he mentioned that uh, in our system, because the amendment process is so difficult, clearly right, uh, the system has developed other ways of affecting changes. Now he mentioned federalism, which has sometimes been a friend of good things sometimes been the enemy of good things. Uh, certainly history of race relations, it hasn't been a friend. But one of the system, one of the ways we have learned to adapt to a cumbersome amendment process is this process of evolution by means of precedent, not just by judges, not just by courts. It wasn't judges and courts who gave us the women's revolution. It wasn't really judges and courts. It wasn't judges and courts at all who gave us the civil rights revolution. They played a role, they came along, they ratified it. But society as a whole decided how the Constitution was going to change, even though we couldn't amend it. And that's our system, an evolving system, a living system, not one that is in thrall to the views of people who lived long ago in a different world.
Thank you, Professor. Um, Professor McInnes, you now have three minutes to respond. Well, obviously there's a lot there. I look forward to the <laughs> Q&A to talk about some of the things. So I just want to focus on really the end of uh, Professor uh, David's remarks, which is, I, I don't think it's the case that federalism is a way, I don't think I said, that federalism was a way of getting around because the constitutional amendment process is so hard. It's quite the opposite of that. Because we have a good constitution, there were many ways to deal with change in the constitution. And federalism is one of those ways. Federalism, as I argued, is the really the way sexual autonomy came, not so much from the Supreme Court, but from the ability of people to go to different states. And so that is a mechanism of constitutional change that's built into the constitution. So that's, so I, and I also don't quite agree at all that uh, the, that, that, that the, amend, the, the, the amendment process is undermined uh, by, uh, as I tried to suggest, by non-originalism. What happens then is we really can't use the amendment process to create constitutional change. I think uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, which David mentioned, is an excellent example of that. I think one reason it was ratified, not ratified, was that it came on the heels of the Warren Court, one of the most anti-originalist courts we've had. And people were very concerned to, to give another blank check to the court, and therefore we didn't have a, a, a ratification. We weren't able to make this intergenerational structure in which we are also framers of the constitution. We don't just decide cases, it's we let some just judges decide cases. It's all the generations get to put things in the constitution, not just through a group of judges. I think it is a mistake to think that uh, the common law is a lot like constitutional adjudication. It's not like it in two important ways. One, it's not like it because uh, when we actually have a statute, we don't let uh, judges make those decisions. Judges interpret the statute. We have a constitutional text here. And so that's different from uh, the common law of constitutionalism that David offers as an alternative. And secondly, the kinds of questions we're asking, and the abortion question is an excellent example of that, doesn't look anything like uh, many of the questions or the, the usual questions of common law about contract and tort, which scholars have argued are guided by ideas of efficiency and, uh, uh, and maybe plausibly so uh, by judges. But these are moral questions that I don't think can be easily taken away from the people. So that I think is why this alternative really doesn't make sense and why I think the important, it's important to understand that the intergenerational story of the constitution has to include the people in allowing them to make the amendments. And that's what originalism protects because we don't have amendments once we think we can actually uh, update the constitution through um, uh, in, in important ways uh, through uh, the judicial process. Thank you, Professor McGinnis. Professor Strauss, your three minutes. Uh, yes, thanks. And I mean, I, I, once again, I don't. I mean, some of the things John says, I don't. I don't want to take issue with at all. I mean, I understand the distinction is made by federalism. And I don't. I don't mean to quibble with that. Um, that it, it's if he sees federalism as being intrinsic to the Constitution, not a workaround. And I understand that. But I do think we should expect to see institutions adapt so that when one avenue of change is blocked, they develop other avenues of change. And when that happens, um, in a very, I mean, hate to keep invoking Burke, but it's a sort of the, a, a Burkean idea, institutions adapt, they grow, they figure out what's going on and what adjustments they need to make. And the way we have developed, the kind of constitution we have developed is an adaptation um, of that kind. Let me say something about, uh, about um, uh, one, I mean, one more ob observation about federalism. Oh, sorry, my cat is climbing on me. That's why I'm a little bit um, uh, a little bit uh, at a loss for words. Um, uh, the sort of point John made about same-sex marriage, uh, you know, that this wasn't imposed by the Supreme Court, clearly true, and that's actually a pretty common pattern, and it is consistent with the idea that we are. We have an evolutionary constitution in which there are many participants, including the people, um, 
uh, but also including the judges. And what happened with same-sex marriage is really the same thing that happened with Jim Crow uh, and women's equality and a whole bunch of other things, which is that the judges um, took a look around them. Sorry for the interruption, but you know he's a cat. He does what he wants. Um, uh, uh, took, took a look around them, saw which way society was heading, saw that racial inequality, Jim Crow segregation was no longer any good. And it was really the courts who instigated the process, the anti-federalism process. They instigated it. They didn't wrap it up. Courts don't have the power to get rid of an institution like that. But they started the process of getting rid of that blight on our society, responding to what they saw as the way things were moving, not responding to the original understandings of Warren Court. John's right. The Warren Court was not interested in originalism. The first sentence of Brown against Board of Education basically says, yeah, we got a lot of briefing on the original understandings, things change. And then, we're, then they were off to the races. Um, let me contrast that with the rulings on gun rights, where the court insisted it was restoring rules that had been adopted by people who lived in a dramatically different world, many of whom, by the way, some of whom were paranoid conspiracy theorists, ignoring the fact that for decades, centuries even, there is a tradition of state and local and federal regulation of guns. That's the equilibrium our society has arrived at. And the court brushed that aside on the basis of its understanding of the original intent. That is the hazard posed by originalism. Okay, thank you. We'll get into some questions now. I do, given that we have a mixed audience here and not everybody is a lawyer and not everybody may be steeped in the terminology that we're using here, I do wanna get back to a little bit of basics and talk about what exactly we mean by originalism. Um, early originalists like Judge Bork in the early 80s and the late 70s uh, talked about the original intent of the framers. And later the originalism movement moved more towards what we're talking about here, the original meaning of the constitution. Uh, so perhaps Professor McGinnis, would you like to talk about the difference between those and why you think presumably more in line with that, with the original meaning uh, cohort, that that's the right way to go and why? Well, I, I think there are a few reasons to think that original meaning is the object of constitutional interpretation. Uh, one is, uh, uh, it's just very hard to sum up what all the different intents was. Moreover, what the, wasn't their intent that was ratified, what they, what they told the people was law, was what the words were. And moreover, that seems to be their own view. Um, uh, one view of mine is we should be very influenced not only by, um, uh, uh, the original meaning, but how they understood what the meaning was to be. And uh, if you look back to what uh, people like Chief Justice Marshall said, he said, he begins with a text. And he says, well, of course, we're interested in the intent, but it's really chiefly collected from the word. So I think that even back then, they understood that even if uh, we're trying to understand what people intended, really the best evidence was for was the text. And so uh, I think there's a general consensus among originalists. There's still a few original intent originalists that uh, the focus should be on, 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 on the text. The text is originally understood. And in my view, the text is originally understood against the rich background of, of law that, that helped people interpret things. But I think it's important to understand that the Constitution is is a is part of a very um, uh, long tradition of Anglo-American Saxon uh, Anglo-Saxon law, and they understood that enactments uh, had um, um, various rules about them. And some of those rules, I do think, help with some concerns that we're going to uh, apply. Uh, rules in very odd ways. I mean, there, there was, for instance, uh, back, even back then, an absurdity canon that suggests that we, we won't apply things that seem absurd uh, if circumstances are so uh, different. So, so, so uh, I, think it, I, I think there has been a consensus to move to uh, original meaning of the text, primarily because the intent would be almost impossible to uh, uh, discover. Thank you. 
but given that original meaning speaks to what uh, I'm assuming the public in general, other judges understood the text, would that be a, an accurate way of, of describing it? The well, state no, legislatures that ratified it? The meaning that is public, I don't think it means that actually, it means that the public understood ever, that every, you know, words like letters of mark and reprisal that uh, would be clearly what lawyers would understand. But uh, to some extent, the constitution is uh, a legal document. And just like any legal document, people would say, well, I have a pretty good understanding of the gist of this, but for some details, for some questions of ambiguity, well, maybe I better consult a lawyer. So I don't think the word public meaning means that it's the meaning to the public. It's the meaning that is publicly accessible at the time of enactment. So given that there seemed to be such disagreements among the framers about what certain clauses meant both during and after the, the Constitutional Convention, uh, that would suggest that the, uh, the meaning is disseminated to the public and to the people who, sorry, maybe not the public, but to the, the audience of the, the Constitution was not always so clear. Um, are we just moving from the understanding and intent of a relatively small group of people, the founding fathers, to trying to understand the what was in the heads of a much larger group of people. Uh, no, the people we're not really whom... understanding what's in the heads of people. We're understanding what the meanings of the words are, and sometimes it's be their their legal meanings. And so that doesn't mean we're even taking a poll. With that's why people look at dictionaries and things of that sort. Uh, I think it's more concrete and more empirically based uh, than, than trying to figure out what's in the heads of people. I, I don't think that's, at least in, in general, the object of the, uh, of the interpretive enterprise. Well, as Professor Strauss mentioned, sometimes that's clear, like 35 years, and sometimes that might not be so clear with a term like liberty. When you have a, a broad term like liberty, how would you suggest maybe give the well, audience an idea well, of what kind of liberty sources is not they would used in, in just the constitution doesn't actually use just the term liberty right don't talk about the you don't take away liberty without due process of law and there mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, scholars have shown that due process not surprisingly let's just take the abortion case at least there are many arguments about about where we root if there were a right to abortion in the constitution. But one argument I do not think is good as an original matter is to root it in the due process of, 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 of liberty clause because due process is a procedural aspect. It doesn't give substantive liberty. And that's wrong, just as it was wrong uh, to have a, a court in the early 20th century say that liberty gave you rights to contract, gave you a right not to have minimum wage laws. Uh, so that, that's just a mistake. Uh, not about the word liberty, but about the word due process. Due process. Uh, so uh, you have to understand the words in their whole context. And that often gives you a helpful a point about the uh, understanding of the, of the Constitution. One point I'd make, and I think this is an important one, is um, that, of course, things are not clear. And there is, I think, a really very important question in originalism is how clear does uh, the original meaning have to be before judges are authorized to strike down legislation, right? That's a, that's a kind of burden of proof rule. And at least in my view, and I've written about this, they have to be pretty certain that this is the meaning that's inconsistent with the meaning to strike uh, something down. And so there are these closure rules uh, that may actually help us with understanding how clear something has to be uh, before judges can use it uh, to invalidate the, uh, what, what a current legislature want to, wants to do. And that may also be one way, actually, of dealing with uh, uh, the question of, uh, uh, of change as well, the fact that we have a burden of proof rule that's somewhat constraining, I think, to, uh, to judges, at least in my view. Professor Strauss, would you like to respond to any of that? Um, yeah, a couple thoughts. Uh, to uh, someone who is skeptical about originalism like me, the what I would characterize as slipping and sliding among various definitions is revealing. Um, it shows that you that it's what I said at the outset that it's very hard to maintain a single coherent or any coherent view of originalism that doesn't automatically get you into trouble. 
So let me give you an example. In, uh, in his opinion, saying that there's an individual right to keep and bear arms, the District of Columbia against Teller, which I should point out, John has a terrific article criticizing aspects of that opinion on originalist grounds, not the, not the aspect I'm going to focus on now. Um, but, but, but just to give you an idea of how, uh, how thoughtful a scholar John is. Uh, at, that, at one point in that opinion, Justice Scalia takes on the argument, which I think is a pretty good argument, that the right to keep and bear arms applied to muskets and things like that, and did not apply to uh, automatic weapons or Saturday night specials. And at that point in the opinion, Justice Scalia stamps his foot and says, yes, con but constitute that's not that bargain's wrong. Constitutional law does not work that way. Well, it's true it doesn't work that way because it's not originalist. That's why it doesn't work that way. But if you look at the meaning, does the meaning of the word arms include uh, AR-15s? Um, to us, sure. To them, well, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. What do we do in that situation? If we're just looking at linguistic meaning, is, is a particular conclusion about the Constitution consistent with what an English language speaker would think of the meaning of the words? The door's wide open. I can, you know, you can give me the Equal Protection Clause. I can establish a redistributive socialist utopia on Earth. And I have colleagues who could establish a libertarian state in which uh, there was uh, uh, only private property rights were. Uh, were protected. The words themselves are just not constraining. So what is it then? Well, is it the way they thought the words applied back then? Well, then it's not really meaning, is it? Then it's specific conclusions they had about the operation of the Constitution. And then you got these familiar problems of that Brown and interracial marriage and equality of women and various aspects of the Bill of Rights, including the coverage of the First Amendment. So there are a whole set of problems there that I think originalists kind of elide by opportunistically changing the definition of, um, uh, of originalism. I'll stop there. Let me just say, I, I, I do think it's not, at least as, as someone as an originalist theorist, I, I think people have been trying to figure out some of these uh, questions and figure them out uh, uh, to look at the argument that the, something like the Equal Protection Clause just doesn't mean how equal protection would strike you or me today. It comes from uh, a rich political legal background that actually gives more determinacy to that, as, as you know, of course, uh, David, people have written long articles uh, trying to determine that. Now, you may say that uh, uh, that's not, uh, all, all I'm saying is that, is that the, 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 there is a way of reading the Constitution as much richer than simply a simple linguistic meaning of what we would understand equal protection to mean, uh, equal protection would strike us as meaning, and that, that gives it a kind of determinacy and firmness uh, that, is, uh, that, that does operate as law in a way that, that maybe, uh, that you couldn't, in other words, get uh, either a libertarian utopia or a socialist utopia from. Can I just pick up on that? I mean, I think the question is these researchers, what are they, what question are they asking themselves? If they're asking the question, when people adopted this provision, what did they think they were accomplishing? Okay, I get that question. Um, but then the problems are the familiar ones. They didn't think they were the Browns, uh, the anti, uh, interracial marriage, even freedom of speech, uh, the Fourth Amendment's application to, to electronic surveillance, all that stuff. They obviously didn't think they were resolving some of those problems. They resolved in ways we don't agree with, but we find unacceptable today. Some of them they didn't even think they're resolving. If that's the question, and I get that. That's a coherent question. If the question is, no, 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 I'm not asking what did they, questions are they resolving? I'm asking what did they think it meant? That I don't get, unless it is, you know, anything an English language speaker could say. And then the doors are wide open. Let me, let me give you one more concrete um, example of this. The Sixth Amendment provides that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall have the right to the assistance of counsel in his defense. The modern Supreme Court interpreted that to mean if you can't afford a lawyer, one has to be appointed for you. That's obviously a plausible linguistic meaning of the assistance of counsel. You've been denied the assistance of counsel if you can't afford a lawyer. It is actually quite clear that's not what they had in mind. What they had in mind was if you have a lawyer, the government can't keep them out of the courtroom. They're not going to give you a lawyer. Now, it seems to me both of those are quite consistent with the meaning of the words. If you want to say, yeah, but one, what they really thought they were doing 
they didn't think they were doing Gideon against Wainwright. Okay, I get that. But then you've got this whole raft of problems with things and with a circumstance in which things have changed, not just moral understandings like, like interracial marriage and the equality of women and so on, but technological understandings like Justice Scalia's example. Professor McGinnis, you look like you want to say something, but well, uh, so I mean, I, I think the uh, issue which is, uh, David is raising is how much the degree to how they thought it would be applied would be connected to their meaning, and I think at least for anything that's abstract like equal protection, you really need to look at uh, their expected implications, expected application, even understand what their meaning is. Meaning is in some sense the way people used words. And so I certainly don't think that uh, the, the kind of expected applications, uh, they're, they're important evidence of the meaning, even if they don't constitute the meaning. One analogy I would make is to kind of regression analysis. You look at their expected applications to see whether you can figure out a principle that captures a good deal of their expected applications. If you're, if you're interpreting the constitution, uh, with all sorts of results that they would not have seen as connected to their meaning, you're probably not capturing their meaning. So that's why I think a fuller understanding of how they thought their clause would apply is, is actually uh, working on what they meant the Constitution to be. It's, the, it's their meaning. It's not what our meaning is. And the question, well, then it must not be socially acceptable. Well, then I think we have the amendment process to deal with that. Of course, we may have made some mistakes. And one other thing I, I, don't, I think was not clear is uh, I think originalism includes precedent. precedent we, we don't go back and revisit all kinds of constitutional questions, but even our precedent requires us to think of whether the law is right or wrong, how badly it's wrong or right or wrong. And that is going to require us to look at uh, the original meaning of the Constitution to try to figure out how far it's departed. Uh, okay, well, we'll be able to touch on this. I think this will be a thread that goes throughout the other questions. Uh, Professor Strauss, you alluded to this in your in your um, first presentation. You said that constitutional interpretation, quote, usually has little to do in practice with the words of the text. Um, if the constant, if the Constitution can change with the winds of time, uh, what is the point of having a Constitution to begin with? Is there a point? You seem to suggest maybe the common law can just stand in for it. Uh, of course, there's a point. There's a point to, and it's, it's, I mean, it's a, what you're saying, Alyssa, is a, is a subtle point. There is a point to having something settled and kind of put beyond debate. Um, you know, the president leaves office on noon on January 20th, despite what some recent occupants of that office thought. And that's very clear, and it's in the text. And for someone to come along and say, yeah, but circumstances are unusual, I need to stay a little while longer to get the wall built or whatever, um, is unacceptable because it's clear. And there is a great virtue in having some things nailed down. And I think the written constitution does a good job of that in a lot of ways. That's being a sort of particularly vivid example of that. The other example is the presidential succession when a president is disabled. We need a rule for that. We can't leave that up to, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's undesirable to leave that up to a squishier process. So you're saying um, that, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to, I thought you were done, go ahead. Well, some things are in that category. Other things that, uh, that the, uh, other things are not settled by the constitution. The words are unclear. And what goes on there is we gain clarity and fixity and this bulwark quality you were you were referring to, Alyssa, that you know we want something that's solid. We gain that through precedent. Think about freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Those things could mean lots of different things. And as I mentioned, the Alien and Sedition Acts, people have thought at various times that, that, that the, the First Amendment doesn't actually forbid um, uh, criminal prosecutions of, uh, of dissenters. Freedom of religion can be abused in a whole bunch of different ways. Equal protection, you know, go crazy. Um, if you just have the words, what gives those solidity is we've developed a whole big body of precedential law that says various things about those. And that's the bulwark. Our um, collective over generations working out of what those provisions of what the constitution requires. And then we refer them back to those provisions. 
And just one more point that's probably, I'm probably going to overstate. I think the way to think about the text, the parts of the text that are unclear, including even some that are kind of clear, but the parts of the text that are unclear, is not that we're looking at the words and we're interpreting the words. It's that we've kind of figured out for ourselves over time what we want the law to be on those subjects. And then we read them back into the words. So today, you will find people who will say, free of speech, of course it means you can't throw someone in jail because they're a dissenter. I mean, that, that's what it means. Well, it's not what it meant to Blackstone. He was very clear about that. Um, it doesn't mean that at all. Um, but what's happened is we have developed ideas about what freedom of speech ought to mean, and then we read them back into the uh, into the text. Professor McGinnis, any response to that? Uh, well, uh, so again, I just want to emphasize that my presentation of originalism does not reject precedent. There are originalists who reject precedent. I don't reject precedent. So it may well be the case that there are some of our ideas are precedent uh, are come from precedent because there are some precedents that I think even under an originalist idea we don't overturn it would you know, turn society into chaos but that doesn't mean that originalism does not have an important role to play first in questions of first impression and we do have those in the second amendment case uh, in the case of uh, the um, uh, uh, recess appointments, uh, which I do think uh, are, are to be governed by the original meaning. And then the other point about precedent is that, and we've seen this again and again in constitutional history, that precedents are overturned and they are often un, can be over, what are they going to be overturned with with respect to? I think they, they can be overturned and they should be overturned uh, with respect to its original meaning. We, the precedents are themselves vulnerable in a way that the text of the Constitution is not. We've had all sorts of precedents that have been overruled correctly and not correctly in, 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 our, in our history. And I think it, therefore it's a mistake to think that our Constitution is founded on precedent rather than founded on text, just as a matter of the way constitutional history operates. Uh, people today are so worried, in fact, uh, because uh, some people are worried because some precedents might be overturned precisely because they actually weren't written as constitutional amendments and they don't have that kind of solidity. We, we would never have had a question of uh, you know, overturning Dobbs if there had been a constitutional amendment um, uh, for uh, uh, giving some kinds of maybe more limited rights to abortion. I want to... Um... I want to um, present a quote here by Justice Neil Gorsuch, who's an avowed originalist. And uh, he said, quote, when it comes to the social and political questions of the day they care most about, many living constitutionalists would prefer to have philosopher king judges swoop down from their marble palace to ordain answers rather than allow the people and their representatives to discuss, debate, and resolve them. You could even say the real complaint here is with our democracy. Professor Strauss, can you address, we haven't in the discussion addressed uh, Professor McGinnis's allusion to the problem of a handful of uh, elites from a very small pond um, making pronouncements about what the constitution should mean. Can you talk your, your your alternative of precedent using precedent and common law doesn't solve that problem. Can you address Gorsuch's concern? Uh, yeah, and I actually am, am uh, reassured that Justice Gorsuch will defer to the will of the people when it comes to gun control, affirmative action, campaign finance, and the regulation of the environment. That's very heartening to hear that he's uh, so opposed to philosopher kings deciding those questions. Um, uh, this actually this is actually picks up on something that I wanted to kind of tie in with something John just said about about um, about the role of judges in this. People think, and I understand where this comes from, that when you talk about precedent, you're talking about judges, and of course, a lot of times you are. But precedent is much broader than that. Um, if the the sort of way to think about precedent, I think, is this is obviously not remotely original with me, is it's an attitude toward what has gone before you. 
It's an attitude of humility and of recognizing the complexity with, of problems and of saying, look, if a lot of people have struggled with this over the years, and here's what they've come up with, you know, don't think you're so smart that because you have some insight, you can toss that all out. Now, does that mean you uncritically accept the past? No, of course it doesn't. You can be critical, but, you know, be careful. Uh, don't, don't go overturning things unless you're really confident that they need to be overturned. And to the extent possible, look for indications that they were already raveling around the ed unraveling around the edges. So it's not just you out there alone saying Jim Crow segregation is unconstitutional. By the time the Warren Court said that, there was a series of cases striking down laws that purported to be separate but equal on the ground they weren't equal, and society as a whole was moving in that direction. That's what I see as uh, as um, as precedent. And so it is not just judges doing stuff, or if it is, the judges are acting where they shouldn't act. It is a matter of adopting this attitude toward what's gone before you. Now, if you're dealing with some highly technical question about the Fourth Amendment, then it's to sort of talk about, well, society is moving in that direction is dumb. That doesn't make any sense. Then you really are looking at previous judges, but then you adopt the same attitude. You know, many of our predecessors have struggled with that. They've gotten to this position. Are we sure they're wrong? Uh, maybe. Um, but that's 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 what I see as uh, as the key to a system of uh, of precedent. John mentioned questions of first impression, and he was right in identifying Second Amendment and recess appointments as questions of first amendment, first impression, well, almost first impression in the Supreme Court. But in fact, there was a ton of history about both those things. And in the recess appointments case, the court explicitly relied on that and said, you know, here's the way we have been doing things, not we the court but we the political branches have been doing things. That's the right attitude. And I think, uh, I mean, I understand why Justice Gorsuch is saying those things, but I think it's really a kind of a uh, rhetorical point rather than uh, not really telling one. Professor McGinnis, you have a brief response? We're, yes, we're well, getting to time. I, I have to say that uh, when we're talking about today and uh, the abortion decision, I think it's very hard to say that it's uh, a rhetorical point. Uh, the abortion decision, Roe v. Wade struck down 50 states abortion laws at the time that didn't strike men as 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 a attitude of humility with a uh, really a, a sweeping uh, decision and the reason it doesn't it's not an attitude of humility it's difficult i think with respect to uh, simply going with a precedent based law uh, is that the text of the constitution creates purposes that are not the judge's own they're the people's uh, purposes and by trying to understand what they meant, that's what encourages an attitude towards humility. I think a judge-made world, a, a, a world, which is, of course, it's going to be the judges who are interpreting what the different uh, points of precedent are and their different points of precedent, I think is necessarily a less uh, humble, world, a humble world. Now, I think also that originalism should have uh, some humility built into it and the judges shouldn't go and strike them down things even on the basis of original meaning unless they're certain about it but if, if we're talking about humility it's hard for me to see uh, and i think the warren court is an example of that of a, a, a world which dismisses the original meaning as one which we're going to have a, a likely attitude of judicial humility Professor McGinnis, um, you talked in your own presentation about the importance of respecting democracy and the democratic process and how living constitutionalism, in your view, might, might threaten that very similar sentiment to what Justice Gorsuch said today. But given recent decisions, um, for example, Shelby versus Holder striking down key parts of the Voting Rights Act that had just been renewed by Congress, um, this recent decisions striking down New York's gun control law that had been in place for many years, um, do you think that the current Supreme Court has used originalism in a way that's deferential to the democratic process? And do you think, you did suggest this in your initial presentation, do you think that's how it should be used? Well, uh, so uh, um, I'm not at all sure that Shelby County is correctly decided. I haven't studied that case. I think there's some good arguments against it. I think it's very hard just from the, if you believe that uh, it's an individual right, it's very hard to accept the New York law. I mean, uh, this, this after all, gave complete discretion to the um, 
uh, New York uh, State uh, to decide whether you had a, a sufficient reason to want a gun. And that's just not the way the first, the, the Second Amendment is written. It doesn't, uh, it seems to be a right. It seems to be the opposite of a right to give people a discretion. Now, there may be reasons that you wouldn't issue a gun. And that, that seems quite plausible. We have a whole First Amendment world where we can think that there are weighty reasons that be absurd to issue a gun, a gun to a felon or something of that sort. That's certainly possible. But the, it strikes me that this is a pretty clear case uh, of, the, uh, of a case where the New York court, again, if you accept that there's an individual right, and I think that's, that's correct, uh, that this kind of law that led it, led it up to the discretion whether or not to give you a right to carry a gun seems very peculiar, just as it'd be very peculiar to say you, up to the discretion of any uh, official, to have, whether you have a right to speak, depending on whether they think your right to speak is important enough uh, in their view. So actually, I think that decision was correct as an original matter. How, how what other restrictions are permitted, um, uh, that I'm, you know, we'll, we'll wait to see as they, they develop. But on, on that, I think that was an, a correct original interpretation of the Constitution, accepting uh, that you have an individual right to uh, keep and bear arms, to bear at least some kind of arm uh, outside the home strikes me uh, without being prevented by the discretion of a, of, a, of a government official strikes me as at the core of, of, of the amendment. Professor Strauss, a very brief rebuttal. Can I cheat by going back to something John said in his last uh, <laughs> remarks about Roe against Wade in the Warren court? Um, so just, just two thoughts. As far as Roe against Wade, a couple ways to think about Roe against Wade. I don't, I don't think it's an easy decision to justify in the first instance. The fact that after it been around for half a century, things change. Um, and then I think it, the, the, the overruling it was clearly wrong. But, you know, but at the core of Roe against Wade are two things that have extremely deep historical roots. One is a person's ability to control her own body. I mean, there are few things that have deeper roots in the law than the idea of my, I control my own body. You can't mess with my bodily integrity absent some extraordinary justification. Now, you know, there are arguments on the other side. We have an extraordinary justification. But the idea that wrote the way to an abortion comes out of nowhere. It's just made up. It was not made up. And the other thing, of course, is the equality of women, which is a relatively new development uh, in our constitutional tradition, but was on the way to developing at the time Roe was decided, thoroughly developed today. You put those two things together along with the right to control the composition of your family, and I think you have a very strong justification for Roe against Wade. Let me just also say, because I co-authored a book on the Warren Court, as John was saying something, I'm sure he didn't mean this because he obviously knows, uh, that Roe against Wade was a Warren Court decision. No, a notable sorry. thing. Yeah, no, notable things. Warren, Warren Court, I, I know you know that, obviously. You know that. Come on. <laughs> uh, um, but just to make the point, uh, for my own purposes, not because I thought John said anything wrong, um, uh, Roe against Wade was a Republican court decision. It was a Nixon court decision. Um, the court included the Roe against Wade majority. Let me see if I can get the numbers correct. There are seven people in the majority. Three of them had been appointed by Nixon, who ran against the Warren Court. Uh, Justice Harlan, appointed by Republican, systematic dissenter on the Warren Court. Justice Stewart, appointed by Republican, himself a Republican, also in the majority. Justice Brennan, appointed by Republican in the majority, but that's cheating a little bit because he was a liberal Democrat. So Roe against Wade at the time was not a liberal or Warren Court decision. And if you think about what the Warren Court did, I think it is very, even though John is quite right in saying, as he did a couple minutes ago, the Warren Court had no patience with originalism. That is true. It's very hard, I think, for anyone today to identify Warren Court decisions, not Roe against Wade, because that's not one of them, Warren Court decisions that you'd overrule. Think about it, Brown against Board, uh, Love against Virginia, about interracial marriage, school prayer, one person, one vote, Miranda, even the most hardcore law and order people have come around to Miranda, right to counsel. Um, uh, those are decisions that are now solidly rooted, and they're solidly rooted not because they're consistent with the original understandings, but because the Warren Court understood these broad trends that I think a true commitment to principle requires you pay fidelity to.
May I just say uh, one, one thing in response to that, and you're quite right to, to correct me, but there's something there's a larger truth about that, that the warrant goes back to my point about humility, right? So the jurisprudential structure that the Warren court set up was really reflected in Roe versus Wade. In other words, the, uh, the as you acknowledge, the, uh, the indifference to the original meaning, I think leads to the kind of judicial arrogance that I think was represented uh, by Roe versus Wade. Uh, and that's, that's really, I think, the larger point about it. And I, I don't also agree with you. I think there are a variety of Warren Court decisions that might well be overruled. I, I would consider the exclusionary rule has been a, a very uh, problematic uh, decision as one that could possibly be overruled in, 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 uh, in the future. But I think, I, I think you don't, at least to me, take enough of the cost of having uh, this kind of freer form a judicial uh, power in in a small body, I think, and that that's that's what leads to uh, uh, a culture a culture uh, that changes over time that gives judges a, a great deal of authority in a way that um, uh, I don't think the Constitution contemplates, and I don't think is good for society. Professor McGinnis, and we'll just have to close with this one question um, from the audience that I know is on a lot of people's minds. Do originalists then not believe in a right to privacy? Uh, originalists don't believe in a right to privacy. As a Well, there's certainly a right to privacy in the Fourth Amendment in your home. Uh, I don't think uh, there's a right, a free-floating right to privacy in the Constitution. No, uh, Griswold is probably also wrongly decided. Uh, of course, uh, as I made my point, which I don't think there's any danger that uh, Griswold is uh, the, the right to uh, contraception is that is any danger. And I think that's not even then it was a sport case. I don't think there was much regulation of, of contraception. The reason that our views of sexual autonomy have changed has very little to do with the Supreme Court and has everything to do with something that is in the Constitution federalism. People went to places like New York and San Francisco and publicized a view about sexual freedom that then was very persuasive even to other uh, parts of the country. And that's really the way things can change. And the advantage of not writing that into the Constitution is sometimes we can have second thoughts, right? Sometimes we can have second thoughts. And unless we have the kind of constitution consensus for a constitutional amendment, it's good to have the people have some second thoughts and have people to agitate in different states that this isn't a good idea. And that's one of the great things about federalism. It allows a forum for disagreement about the nature and direction of social change. Is it time for a new constitutional convention? Another question from the audience. Uh, I think it'd be a terrible idea. Um, uh, I think uh, I mean, is this actually related to questions about constitutions providing stability? Um, the, your question listed in some points John's, of course, made here and elsewhere about constitutions providing stability. And also, to the extent you accept the idea that you should see our constitutional tradition as one that uh, values uh, incremental change, humility, uh, humility, uh, let's uh, strike incremental change. Um, all those things, a constitutional convention, you get a bunch of people elected, you know, who, who knows who they'll be um, uh, together to try to rewrite things from the ground up. Uh, you know, it could work. Uh, it's, a, it's a possibility that, as has happened, I would say, with originalists, their thinking is actually so conditioned by the constitution we actually have, which is not originalist, that they keep reading non-originalist things into their originalism. Uh, and it's possible that the participants of the Constitutional Convention would think, oh, well, of course, I mean, we need a protection against the, uh, against this and that, and we need this sort of criminal justice system. And of course, we have to have juries just because they're used to that system without thinking it from the ground up. But I would not turn our whole tradition over to um, to a bunch of people, no matter how elected, uh, to, to rewrite the whole thing from the start. I think that would be a ter terrible idea. We Professor have McGinnis a constitutional is convention, close. but at least my hope is with the rise of originalism, we'll see more constitutional uh, amendments. One of the shocking things to me, actually, is the decline in constitutional amendments. Remember, there were 48 states when we had 
the right to women to vote, uh, uh, the 16th Amendment, income taxes. Those are dramatic amendments. And I, I, I think uh, you know, another debate about the Equal Rights Amendment, that would be very healthy for our society. I want to thank you both so much um, for taking the time to be here. This was a terrific discussion. I'm sure we all learned a lot. Um, I want to thank everybody again for attending. I remind you to complete the survey that appear should appear on your screen. If not, it will go out to you shortly. If you're in, in Illinois and want CLA credit, look for an email in the coming days and watch for our next program in the next couple months. Again, a civil disagreement about a critical and timely issue. Thank you again so much to everybody who participated and have a wonderful weekend.